Hello, my name is Jessica Rosenfeld and I'm from the United Nations University in Bonn. I'd like to talk to you today about teaching, capacity development, and technology. An overview of the presentation today, we're going to go over the UNU system, Priority Africa initiative, e-learning, open education, and quality assurance, and some other teaching and capacity development uses of ICT at UNU. The United Nations University was established in 1973 by the UN General Assembly as an academic arm of the UN system. The UNU implements research and educational programs in the area of sustainable development, focusing on developing countries. This UN mandate enables the UNU to be active in fostering policy dialogues. Rather than focusing on specific fields of study, the UNU takes a problem-orientated approach. All the work conducted by the UNU can be summarized into five thematic areas. Particular to this conference would be of interest points three and five. The map represents the global distribution of UNU institutes, programs, and administrative units. As you can see, the majority of UNU facilities are located primarily in developed countries, which have the resources, while the regions where much of the development work is taking place do not have established UNU facilities. Here in Bonn, we have the Vice Rectorate in Europe, which is responsible for liaisons with European institutions, as well as the United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security, UNUEHS. If you'll also note on the map, highlighted is the United Nations Institute for Global Health. Realizing the aforementioned issue regarding the unequal distribution of UNU system organizations, there has become a push to create twin institutes. In a nutshell, the concept is to have two institutes, one located in a resource-rich region and another in a region that is still developing its capacities. The two institutes are working on the same topic. For example, UNU Flores. It's the Institute for Integrated Management of Material Fluxes and Resources. One campus is to be located in Maputo and the other in Dresden. As mentioned before, the UNU has an institute focusing on global health issues. The key mission of this institute is to undertake research, capacity development, and dissemination of knowledge related to key issues in human health. Here in Bonn is the Institute for Environment and Human Security, whose mission is to advance human security through knowledge-based approaches to reducing vulnerability and environmental risks. UNUEHS is the institute where I come from, specifically the EGEG section. As you will note from the cast of characters, Dr. Jorg Sharzinski is the head of section. You might be familiar with him from his work in SPIDER before. The purpose of the section is to strengthen the institutional capacity of UNUEHS and academic institutions worldwide with respect to delivery methods, relevant content, teaching capacity, and target groups as they apply to educational and research programs. An initiative we have here is the Priority Africa Initiative. This is a UNU-wide initiative. And the initiative was started by the UNU Council in 2008 to spotlight the organization's work in Africa. The initiative brings together stakeholders, experts, partners, funders, policymakers, and UNU institutes under one umbrella, which promotes development and knowledge sharing. The initiative is co-led by Professor Jacob Reiner, Vice Rector of UNUVIE and Rector of UNUEHS. He's located here in Bonn, as well as Professor Ilya Sayuk, the Director of UNU INRA, the Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, located in Accra. The work that we engage in can be looked at as being an interwoven nexus of science, education, and practice. 
When looking at the following projects, please keep these three spheres in mind. The West African Science Service Center on Climate Change and Adaptive Land Use, also known as WASCAL, is a large-scale research-focused program which was initiated to develop effective adaptation and mitigation measures to climate change. The geographical focus of WASCAL is on selected case studies in watershed within Western Africa. Some specific aspects to this project that would be of interest to the audience here um, is that the WASCAL project is building a database with information that has been collected over the past decade. Some of the data collected includes biophysical features that can assist epidemiologists, and this data could potentially be used for modeling and other elements. Again, UNUIIGH, our Global Health Institute, provides uh, postgraduate training to Sudanese students in public health and hospital management. This program leads to a master's degree in public health specializing in hospital management. It is undertaken in collaboration with the University of Medical Science and Technology, Sudan, the National University of Malaysia, and the Sudanese Ministry of Health. The MPH program is building human resource capacity that will have a lasting impact on the healthcare system in Sudan. Moving to e-learning, open education, and quality assurance. A specific example of the work that we've done in e-learning uh, takes place in Cameroon. Together with the University of Duisburg Essen, UNUVIE EHS, is working to facilitate a pilot project on e-learning at the University of Yaoundé 1 in order to create e-learning center and produce five e-learning course modules. Professor Mama Fuponini had identified two major problems at his university, Yaounde One, that were inhibiting the students' ability to receive quality education. The first one was an overcrowding of classrooms and not enough professors. The second was that it was a very expensive cost for maintaining a modern library with the resources students would need to fill the learning gap created by the overcrowding. The solution was to create a homegrown University of Yaoundé wide e learning system. To ensure the ownership among professors and students, brainstorming, e learning training, and course development was all handled by the university, supported through bringing in external experts. The concept, which was conceived in 2008, remained unfunded until the first e school in 2011, which was supported by the DAAD. This project has taken us to another level of institutional cooperation between the United Nations University Vice Rector in Europe and Yaounde One. Firming up the agreement was a MOU that was signed in January of this year. One of our flagship programs here at the United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security is the PhD block course. The overall goal of the block course is to highlight the complexity and importance of vulnerability and resilience in the field of disaster risk management. UNU EHS works with the University of Bloemfontein in South Africa Disaster Risk Management Training and Education Center for Africa to create this PhD block course. With regard to e-learning, Modal has been used as a platform to keep students abreast of relevant information before and after the course. Modal was also used at the University of Yaounde 1. Currently, UNU EHS is engaged in developing an e-learning system to encapsulate the work of the Institute. Our e-learning networks are quite extensive and continuously growing. Regarding quality assurance in e-learning, we have a former connection through quality assurance with the open ECB check with regard to the University of Yunde, where we had sent a student before. The open ECB check, open e-learning for capacity development. The program runs training courses and also train the trainers. Peer assessment 
is the first stage, whereby an individual enters the data regarding the course into an online form. Then the course is subject to peer review, which results in certification. Quality assurance and e-learning further. The pictures you see on the left were taken from a training course that was held in Turin in July of 2011. To the right is the online tool described before. The tool provides criteria that allows the user to enter data about the course. Questions related to the quality of the e-learning course, such as testing the structure, methodology, didactics, is important. Open Education and Quality Assurance Open Ed is an EU-funded project hosted by UNU Merit teaching business management competencies. This course was certified by Open ECB Check. Other UNU Education Projects We have been involved in open education for quite some time, since 2007. First institute to implement OCW was MIT in 2002. Having all these materials free and public is just the first step. The next step is the evolution of free and open courses to ensure that students receive credits and certification for their labors. This is where the OER test project comes in. It answers the question of how can open educational resources be mainstreamed through providing a framework for higher educational institutes within the European Union to give credits to students who have used OER. One solution that they came up with was the learning passport concept. This would be a tool for institutions and students to properly assess the knowledge that can be gained from courses, which also leads to better transparency. Back to our friends at UNU IIGH, they too are working in the field of e-learning with regard to public health specifically. In line with the core mission of UNU IIGH is to provide capacity building and promote efficiency, access, quality, and deliver for healthcare services. They conducted a short course on using case mix What is the impact of ICT on our ability to create and maintain networks? Currently, the UNU is working to bring together two regional centers in geospatial science into the folds of its network through becoming associated partners. These two institutes, excuse me, these two regional centers, Brechtus and RCMRD, both are intergovernmental organizations having similar objectives, and were established in the 1970s under the auspicious of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Back to Cameroon. Cameroon in Context, a case study. We were approached by different partners with specific issues of how we could design e-learning materials appropriated for different stakeholders involved in different issues. How can we involve the local e-learning experts and communities to support this? How can education and science join forces in order to develop appropriate skills set for the specific needs? In this case, we have tectonic, volcanic activities in Cameroon, etc. The solution we came up with was bringing together networks to begin investigating how different ways to develop an e-learning platform could be established. This workshop was a UNU spider workshop with UNU EHS, and it brought together information on space-based information. So, to the problem of brain drain. Brain drain from Africa is a major issue, as it is from a lot of other developing countries. Through the use of efficient ICT, we can help to reduce brain drain and create a situation of brain gain. Harnessing the African diaspora for research and development cooperation. 
some facts and figures which demonstrate the potential power in diaspora communities. Over 300,000 professionals reside outside of Africa. More than 3,000 doctors have left Ethiopia. There are more Ethiopian doctors on the east coast of the U.S. than there are currently in Ethiopia. Between one-third, excuse me, between one-third to half of all graduating doctors in South Africa migrate to the U.S., United Kingdom, and or Canada. Over 21,000 Nigerian doctors are practicing in the U.S. There are reportedly more Malawi-trained doctors in Manchester, England, than there are in the whole of Malawi. An example of an area where diaspora can play an important role is in telemedicine and teleeducation. Specific examples from a partner of ours at the University of Louisiana who works in Cameroon, Victor Mabarika. He's the president of ICT University, which offers short certificate programs in e-learning, telemedicine, and executive technology leadership. Diaspora can play an important role when it comes to acquiring medical data of patients in Africa, transmitting to diaspora professionals for assessment and subsequent feedback within Africa and to Africa, remote monitoring, remotely monitoring of a patient by a professional using various technological devices, interactive services such as real-time interactions, phone conversations, online communications between patients in Africa and professionals among the diaspora worldwide. Specific case study, the genesis of telecare experience in Cameroon. The majority of the patients who were seen were in the cardiology department. Thousands of patients had high blood pressure. Several of them did not know the risks related to their conditions. Patients received immediate treatment and prescriptions and free distribution of drugs. This is an excellent example of how telemedicine can assist a community directly in a developing country. Thank you for your time. I'll be happy to take questions after the presentation.